are Locked On Kentucky, your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what is going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on in to Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Dahl, writer for Sports Illustrated for various SEC-related things. But on this podcast, we take a dive into all things Kentucky athletics. On today's episode of Locked On Kentucky, we are going to be previewing Kentucky basketball's matchup with the Kansas State Wildcats in the round of 32 Going to be talking about the different matchups in this one. Going to be talking about how maybe Kentucky's got a better shot in this one than some people may think. I'm pretty confident in the Wildcats heading into this one. I'm going to break it down for you guys today, so make sure... You are subscribed as we walk through today's episode. Tomorrow, we're going to have a live show talking about on YouTube, about, you know, uh, the post game, about what these uh, what these cats did against these other Wildcats. So make sure you're subbed on the channel if you do not want to miss that. Also, if you're on podcast, please leave a review. Uh, it would mean a ton to us here if you left a five-star review on the channel wherever you're watching. Uh, it would be great. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. The Kentucky Wildcats, I think have a very legitimate shot of taking down the Kansas State Wildcats. And I know the performance against Montana State for KSU was impressive. They got past a decent Montana State squad, and they were able to kind of close things out late. Here's what I want to point out. A couple of things here. I know that some of you believe that I am too reliant on on metrics, on numbers, on different things like that. I'm not going to give you as many numbers today, but I want to start this off by explaining to you where Montana State came from. They were 112th in the country, according to Kim Palm. They were the 112th best team. Statistically, on both sides of the ball, they were not elite. They actually had a very average offense and then a slightly above average defense. This is coming from the Big Sky Conference. I'm not disrespecting Montana State by saying they're a bad team. They went 25-10 and and they won their conference tournament. I'm saying relative to the competition that Kansas State will play from here on out, Montana State was probably the easiest matchup they'll have. I I, I think that that's fair to say, especially considering what Kansas State's uh, State's strengths are, which we're going to get to here in a second. Montana State relied a lot on getting to the foul line. Uh, throughout the course of this season, they didn't shoot particularly well uh, from any uh, from any category. They they just didn't get blocked a lot, and they uh, they didn't turn the ball over a ton. Uh, and then on defense, they were pretty solid on the interior. Uh, outside of that, it was not a, like an elite Montana State squad by no means. And credit Kansas State for being able to pull away in that one. But I just don't know if we've seen Kansas State in this tournament really face off against a team that is comparable to Kentucky. I don't think Montana State's comparable to Kentucky. Now, what I will say about the Wildcats is that the rest of their schedule very much so is comparable to the Kentucky Wildcats. The Big 12 this year, I think, uh, has to be the most difficult conference uh, in the country. Kansas State finished 11-7 and in league play. Very impressive with the way that they closed things out in the regular season. They won four straight before losing to West Virginia on the road. That West Virginia team was playing extremely desperate, losing by eight on the road to a team that just really wanted to get into the tournament. I, I, I understand that. I understand that, 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 uh, that loss there. There were a couple different spots throughout their season that kind of gave you like a, hmm, that's interesting. Like they really didn't match up with TCU well. They lost 82-68 the first time they played. Then they watched, lost 80-67 to in the first round of the Big 12 tournament. Uh, they came into this thing playing pretty decent offense and pretty solid defense, which is kind of what they've been statistically so far this year. I wouldn't say that they're playing bad basketball right now. There was a stretch in the middle of the season there where they lost, what, uh, five, out of, five out of seven there? Uh, they, they got a couple wins against Florida, and they beat TCU at home, uh, right there sandwiched between four, uh, four losses. Uh, interesting stuff there. But the thing about Kansas State that I want to get to here, starting with their offense, is they are not elite, but they do poise a threat where Kentucky is weak. If that rhymed, I did not intend it to. They're really, really good at getting to the rim and drawing fouls, similar to Montana State. They are currently top 50 in the country in percentage of points that come from the free throw line. They are shooting very well from two. They have several players, several wing-like players, that really do an excellent job 
at finding ways to get to the rim. And Jerome Tang, the head coach of Kansas State, is very, very, very good at setting these guys up, especially on both ends, but especially creating looks for them uh, in transition and creating looks for them in the half court. He has coached this team very well. And I think part of that is the fact that, you know, there is a lot of experience on this team. Jerome Tang has gotten a couple of transfers in here, and they've all been around the college game for quite some time, and they've excelled in his offensive system. They are currently, Kansas State is, 30th nationally in Division I experience on average per player. They've got a couple of really old players. In fact, their three most used players are all seniors, and the fourth one's a junior. If I'm not mistaken, they only have one freshman in their rotation, and he has played less than 10% of the team's minutes. Dorian Finster. Finster. So this is a very experienced team, similar to Kentucky. Both these teams have a lot of experience on both sides, right? The problem with the Kansas State offense, with them getting to the rim, is they don't just get to the rim. They don't just, okay, give somebody the ball and get them downhill. They do a lot of distribution. They spread the ball around. They're really, really good at that. Now, there's, there's, a, there's a caveat to this, which is while they do pass the ball around a lot, they also end up turning it over a lot. They're bottom third in the country easily. They're one of the worst teams in the nation in turnover percentage. They turn it over on 20% of their possessions. They get blocked a lot. They're, they're three in the 300s in that category. They, they're susceptible to steals. They're 311th in that category. I, they, they commit a lot of turnovers. They spread the ball around, with, and they play with a, with a frenetic pace, something that, uh, that Kentucky has also struggled with, getting back on defense. We saw, <laughs> we saw that in the, in the Providence game. So there's a caveat to them spreading the ball around here quite a bit. But they do it. They still do it at an incredibly high rate. Which brings me to the three players I think we need to be paying attention to on the offensive side of the ball. We've got Marquise Noel, who is five foot eight and 160 60 pounds. You may say, oh, well, he, he shouldn't be that much of a problem. I'd like to see Severe Wheeler on him. Well, here's the issue with, with Noel. He's second in the country in assist rate. The kid averages almost eight assists a game. He gets out in transition, and he is flying, looking for people to distribute the ball to. He has been excellent so far for them this season. Now, he's not a good shooter. He's shooting sub 40% from the floor. He takes a lot of shots. He is a very dominant guard. He's used on a lot of their possessions outside of one other player who we're going to get to in a second. He averages almost 17 points, like I mentioned, eight assists per game. He's shooting 35% from three, and he's shooting almost 90% from the foul line. So he's a, he's a, he does what, he, what a point guard should do, which is distribute the basketball, and he gets buckets on top of it, but man, he takes a lot of shots. Kaysen Wallace or Severe Wheeler, if he's healthy, will draw this assignment. I feel comfortable with Wallace if he's able to get a little bit more rest and get a little bit more healthy, but here's the problem. What did we talk about on yesterday's episode? Wallace is currently not healthy. He's currently dealing with injuries still. He's not 100%. And it showed in that game against Providence. He went two for 11. He did have five assists, only one turnover. So the question here is, what does Kaysen Wallace look like from a health perspective guarding one of the best assist men in the country, if not the best? It's a question to ask. I think it's definitely one of the bigger matchups in this game. I think the fact that Wallace has some length on him is nice, but Noel's speed is going to be a concern. If you don't have Wallace on him, do you have Wheeler? I almost like that matchup a little bit more because Wheeler, I think whenever he comes back, he will be uh, just as healthy as Wallace, if not healthier, just to make sure that he's really, really good to go. And I think the fact that he's able to stay... I, I'm, I, how, how do I not make this sound odd? Wallace at six foot four compared to Noel at five foot eight. If you've got Wheeler who's five nine on a kid that's five eight, I feel like he's able to move with him a little bit better. Maybe that's just me. I know that length is obviously a factor and when it comes to defense, but I, I think that Wheeler could certainly hold his own here. Especially considering he's very similar statistically in what he likes to do, just doesn't score as many points. Keontae Johnson is the second player I want to get to here. Transfer from Florida. It's such a great story with Johnson to, uh, to have seen him 
kind of bounced back from what was a very, very, very scary injury. I believe it was heart-related uh, just a couple of seasons ago. He's made his way back into basketball, and he has been excellent. I mean excellent for Kansas State this year. He has had one of the most impressive seasons that I have seen from a leading scorer in quite some time. He's averaging 17.7 points a game. He's shooting over 51% from the floor and 41% from three. This guy not only has been a bucket getter, but unlike Noel, he's been very efficient in doing so. I'm very impressed with Keontae Johnson and his rebound and I think that he is going to be a problem. Six foot six, 230. Who draws this assignment? I think right off the bat, you think it's got to be Chris Livingston, right? Livingston, who has kind of tailed off here as the season has gone off statistically, uh, outside of still being a very uh, aggressive rebounder. I'm curious to see what he looks like defensively in this one. How does he hold up against Keontae Johnson, another kid who can get out in transition and get to the rim? Could Jacob Toppin potentially be somebody that you see on Keontae Johnson a little bit in this one? Could you see maybe Chris Livingston have to play against Cam Carter? Or is that Antonio Reeves' assignment? It could be It could be a question to ask. I'm curious to see what the defense for rotation looks like. For an offense that is, not, that is just borderline top 50 nationally, I'm surprised at how, uh, at how low they are. I figure they'd be higher when you look at just some of their base numbers. The final player I want to get to here before we move along is is Desi Sills, formerly of Arkansas and Arkansas State, went to both of those programs. Now at Kansas State uh, for for what could be his 40th year. This kid could be a problem. With Reeves, Antonio Reeves, drawing this assignment, more than likely, Desi Sills, who is the fourth leading scorer on this team, he, um, he, he could be an issue. He doesn't shoot well from deep. But he gets to the rim, like all these other guards, and he's explosive. He can jump. He can throw down dunks. We got to see that in the Montana State game. We've seen it all year. This Kansas State team likes to throw lobs, man. And Sills has been on the the receiving end of quite a few of them this year. He's only averaging about eight and a half a game. But with Antonio Reeves, who is currently 10th on on Kentucky's team in defensive rating, which is points allowed per 100 possessions, uh, that's, um, that's a concerning assignment. Just straight up, right? In case you're wondering, the the second option here, if we're playing if we're playing the rotation game, and we're saying, well, maybe C.J. Frederick draws the assignment even worse. Frederick is next to last on the team in that category, defensive defensive rating. Um, I hate to continue to rag on the kid, but he's just not been contributing uh, this season as a whole, and especially late here, uh, mostly due to his injury, I assume. Uh, that, that a lot of people would have liked to have seen him uh, contribute. He's not been contributing at, 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 at a high level, full stop. So Noel Johnson, Desi Sills, I didn't even talk about their, their big man, Naquan Tomlin, who has been efficient inside for them this season. He's not known as a three-point shooter. He's also not known as like a crazy strong rebounder, um, which will be interesting. There, I'm going to get to the defense here. There are a lot of reasons why you should be impressed with Kansas State's defense. But I think that Kentucky matches up well with it. I want to explain why in just a second. Before we do that, though, I want to tell you guys about our friends over at FanDuel. The tournament is heating up. Obviously, we're in the round of 32. It's the best time of the season. And now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book. New customers get a no-sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars and that's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win all you have to do is download the FanDuel Sportsbook app it's safe secure it's super easy to use you can bet on everything from money line to point scores threes drained all that good stuff you've also got player props like points rebounds assists steals and on top of all of this FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay so, don't miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. To learn more, you can make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports bank partner of the NBA. All right, continuing along here on what is the Saturday edition of Locked On Kentucky. We are in the thick of things here in March. Really appreciate everybody listening and watching the show as of late. I've really enjoyed hopping on lives and talking to some of you guys. I'm, I'm genuinely surprised with the, the amount of people that show up 
<laughs> to those things. Uh, so really appreciate you guys listening on podcast and, and making sure that you're tuned in there. I really appreciate you guys on YouTube. If you are not subscribed, wherever you are listening, subscribe to the show. That's all we ask for today. Also, uh, if you've not checked out the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, this is, this is not me asking. This is just merely a suggestion, a, a strong one at that. Go check out the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. Isaac Shade and Andy Patton do great stuff, and they are currently uh, rising up the, the charts uh, across podcast uh, po- podcast charts, and they've been doing an excellent job. They're covering the NCAA tournament, so Locked On College Basketball Podcast, wherever you get your podcast. The Kansas State defense, according to most metrics, is the better side of what the Wildcats like to do. It's their stronger side. They're 20th nationally in adjusted efficiency, and they currently are one of the best three-point defenses in the nation. Here's what I think could be a problem. What does this Kansas State team like to do? They like to get out in transition, and they like to get to the rim. What does Kentucky like to do? They like to get to the rim, but they don't get out in transition nearly as much. They just like to get to the rim in the half court. They've got several guys that can get downhill and, and score a tough basket. We saw in that Providence game, Kentucky drive inside quite a bit. And I think on both sides of the ball, I'm not saying Kentucky got hosed. I'm, let me be very, very clear. The officiating was okay because it was the same for both sides. What I'm saying is that Kentucky did not benefit from whistles that were tight, unlike the rims. And so there was a lot of physical play at the basket, whether it be finishing uh, layups, whether it be grabbing rebounds. There were a lot more fouls that could have been called. And I think that Kentucky is probably, for what they want to do on offense, going to conti- excuse me, going to continue to drive to the basket. There are two things that this Kansas State team does not do extremely well. And that's grab offensive rebounds, or excuse me, it's grab defensive rebounds, and it's control things inside the paint. Two-point field goal percentage. And you may say, why is that? Well, there's a statistic that I've yet to bring up for you guys, and it's average height for this team. The best thing about Kentucky's draw, and I hate to look down the road, But the best thing about Kentucky's draw that I was saying heading into this tournament is a lot of teams that Kentucky's going to face off with are short. Like, they're really short. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean there's an extreme advantage, as we saw with with Purdue and and FDU. FDU is literally the shortest team in the nation. Purdue was literally the tallest team in the country, the second tallest. And uh, FDU won. So any team that's smaller can win. By no means am I saying that that, that that is a guaranteed matchup advantage for the Wildcats. I'm saying on paper, this looks like something that Kentucky can take advantage of. What did Oscar Shibway just do? He grabbed 25 rebounds in a very strong effort. Now, granted, he didn't shoot the best from the floor. And that was not, I think, due to officiating. Now, there were a lot of really questionable things that were called on Oscar, um, which has uh, just kind of been the theme this season. I don't really, I don't really have a, a strong meltdown feeling about it. But this Kansas State team is extremely undersized. They're 312th nationally in average height. And they don't grab rebounds at a crazy rate. Now, they grab offensive rebounds, but they don't grab defensive rebounds. According to Ken Palm, they don't. They also, on top of all this, are not great at keeping teams off the foul line. I didn't pull up the direct statistic on NCAA.com, but I've got it pulled up on on Ken Palm here. They, um, in terms of field field goal attempts relative to free throw attempts, they, um, they, they allow teams to get to the line quite a bit. Now, teams don't shoot well from the line against them, but that's also another factor. I think I've said this, gosh, like for every game preview, uh, over the past month, I've talked about Kentucky at the foul line and how it may end up end up being really important that Kentucky is shooting decently well uh, from the foul line down the stretch. Now, they didn't shoot well against Vanderbilt. I know they didn't shoot well against Vanderbilt. They shot 55% from the line in the SEC tournament. But as a whole, Kentucky's free, free throw shooting has gotten better. They actually have risen into the 70% 
uh, range. And against Providence, what did they do? They went 10 of 13, 76.9%. You've got to have that again. So what am I saying here about this Kansas State defense? Well, they've got a couple of guys that are really solid. Marquise Noel averages two and a half assist, or steals per game. Keontae Johnson, Naquan Tomlin, Desi Sills, they all average at least one a game. The team averages 7.7 as a whole. Um, they're, they're decent in all these categories, but they're short on paper. This is how I'm breaking it down. On paper, they're shorter. They do not protect the rim well, and they don't grab defensive rebounds at a high rate. On paper, this is similar to what we saw against Providence. You've got your seven or six foot ten center, Naquan Tomlin, but he's only 210 pounds. I say only. I mean, obviously he's a he's a grown man. But I think, I think, in theory, this means that Jacob Toppin and Oscar Shibwe should be able to get to the rim and score better than they would against a team that is taller and maybe more physical at the rim. And you may say, oh, the Lance, that's so disrespectful. Kansas State's this, that, and the other. Again, I'm just going based off what we've seen against some other teams this year, and I'm going based off of what their numbers say, right? I'm just, I'm just projecting out here. You look at different teams in the past that have faced off against Kansas State that they've lost against. I'm pulling up some of the box scores before this, before this, um, before this uh, preview episode airs, and I'm just looking at some of their losses. You look at the game against Texas. The opposing team, Texas, shot 54% from the floor, or excuse me, 54% from two. Iowa State, another loss where Kansas State gave up 80 points. Iowa State shot almost 70% from two. Almost 70%. It's because they're taller, and they've got more physical wings. You look at that Texas squad, who is still kicking it in the NCAA tournament. They've got a couple of really strong wings. Jabari Rice, Timmy Allen, Dylan DeSue. Marcus Carr is even somebody that has shown the ability to physically get to the basket and finish strong. I think Kentucky has an advantage here. I know the defense for Kansas State is good. Don't get me wrong. They're feisty. They speed you up. I just don't know if they're going to be able to shut down the best parts of Kentucky's offense. Now, the factor in all of this, the X factor in all of this, is something that I've yet to discuss, and it's the final thing I want to touch here before we get out. Three-point shooting for both of these teams may end up being crucial. I've talked about the foul line. I've talked about the rebounding margin. That's something to watch in this one. I've talked about the individual matchups with Noel uh, Johnson, Sills, Jacob Toppin, Oscar Shibwe. Antonio Reeves was shooting really well in that game against Providence. I mean, he was all, firing on all cylinders. I believe led led all player or all yeah all players in scoring with twenty two. If he is on, going to be your only three point shooter, how 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 impactful? is that in a game like this against a really solid team that likes to get out, get out and run? What does Kansas State and their three-point shooting look like? They're underneath average nationally in three-point percentage. Do they have somebody like Keontae Johnson or Desi Sills just heat up from outside the arc? Do they see that? Do you see for Kentucky, all of a sudden, you see the Wildcats have somebody like Antonio Reeves Pop off again. Do you see Case and Wallace finally start to hit some shots from outside the arc? Do you see Severe Wheeler come in and knock down a couple of threes? Because he statistically has been pretty decent from deep this year. I don't know where the three-point shooting is truly going to come from with confidence for the Wildcats outside of Reeves. But I'll say this. If Kentucky can't find a way to get some outside looks and hit them, against this Kansas State team, if things get out of control, then it's going to be a problem. This Kansas State team can speed you up and get you out of sorts, and they can create havoc. They're really good at guarding the perimeter, and so if Kentucky gets desperate, I can see them doing what I've seen some of these players and this program over the past couple of seasons do when things get wild. They start to take inefficient shots. 
We've seen it all season long. The three-point shooting for Kentucky has been good when they're under control. I would like to see more threes and less mid-range shots in this game if we can help it. But I don't want to see things get out of control. This team has to focus up for this one. Duh. Right now, Kim Palm thinks that Kentucky's going to lose this game 73-74. They think that Kentucky's going to lose this game by one point. ESPN's BPI says that Kentucky has a 60% chance to win this game. So it's a toss-up. Kentucky, according to, uh, according to ESPN, is actually favored by three. At, le- at least that's, uh, that's about where, where, they, where they have that. Uh, I don't believe it's the line. I think it's their, their pick center. No, Kentucky is favored by three in this game. So maybe Vegas knows a little something about the matchup too. I'm not saying I know anything like I'm, like I'm a genius or anything here. I think I'm taking Kentucky. I didn't feel great about the Providence matchup. I think this is going to be another game you have to grind out, right, with, with Kansas State. Find a way to slow them down. Find a way. I'm going to take Kentucky to win this one. And I'm going to say the same thing that I said about Providence. I'm going to take the Wildcats by five. I felt comfortable with that. I think I'm going to stick to it again. I think Kentucky wins this game by about five. If you've got any thoughts on the final score, if you strongly disagree with me, if you're a Kansas State fan that wants to gripe and complain or come back after Kentucky loses by 40 uh, in this one, you can leave it in the YouTube comments below. Uh, just give me a, any of your thoughts, any of your questions on this uh, on this game. I'd be more than happy to, to, to hit you up if I, if I see the comment. So that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked on Kentucky. Hey, you can follow the show on Twitter at Locked on UK. You can follow me on Twitter at Lance Dahl underscore, and you can follow the show over on, on uh, Instagram. That is at Kentucky Podcast. Any questions, comments, concerns, you can leave them in the YouTube comments. You can also hit me on the socials. I will see you all tomorrow for another episode of Locked on Kentucky. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day. And God bless.